Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for everyone here, God. Thank you so much for Father's Day, God. We just pray that um, you will just strengthen us, encourage us, help us to rejoice, God, that this is the day that you have made and that we will rejoice and be glad in it. We just pray right now for all those people who maybe didn't have a good father or maybe just don't even know their father, God, that you will be the father to the fatherless, God. And Lord, I just pray for those fathers who are here, God. Thank you so much for them coming, God. And I pray that they will be refreshed, encouraged, God. And you'll just speak to them. You'll speak to all of us, God. And you'll help us to just love one another in this place, God. I pray that as we worship you, that we will be excited, that we will be passionate, that we will just ask your Holy Spirit to just fill this place right now, God. That no one will be able to leave this place without feeling loved and without hearing your voice, God. And that this will truly be a church that will be a home and a family to people, God. And I pray for the unity, and I pray that you'll just find the evil one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy and attack your people. We know that a lot of us, well, almost all of us, we have a lot of sadness, depression, and we have a lot of things going on, God. I pray that we'll just be able to lay all of our cares, our worries, and anxiety at your feet right now, God, and that we'll just be able to be still and rest in your presence, God, that you'll fill us up that you'll give us joy overflowing, God. And I pray that as we worship you, we will just be so excited to be in your presence that we'll raise our hands and just sing as loud as we can, God, because we love you and we don't care about what anyone else thinks, God, but we just want to please serve and honor you, God. Just thank you again for this time that we have. I pray that we will just love you and show you we love you, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
believe we have some time right now, so I just pray that we can just right now be still before the Lord, because I know that even right now my mind is rushing that, oh, we don't have a lot more time in worship, so we have to hurry up, but I feel like God just telling all of us right now to just be still. This is a place that we can rest. Everywhere else in the world is telling us to go faster and faster. But maybe you don't have any time in the day you feel like to just be still. So I feel like God wants to just give you this time right now to just be still. Whether that means to just sit in your seat or bow down and just ask God to search your heart to see if there's anything you're anxious about. Anything you're doing that is wicked and evil that is hurting his heart. You just confess and get right right now. Because I just feel right now from the Lord that I just feel like there's this barrier with some people here. That they just see all these other people worshiping, but they don't understand why they don't feel it. Maybe they don't want it. Maybe they just, maybe they just think that we're weird. They don't know why they're here. But Lord, I just pray that you'll soften their hearts, God. That they'll see we're not just raising our hands and getting excited just to just for some hype, just to look cool, but if anything, we kind of look ridiculous sometimes, but I pray that for those who are really truly worshiping that we just won't care, God, because we just love you so much. Pray, God, for those people who haven't really experienced you in worship, God, haven't even ever experienced you just in life, God, that you'll touch their hearts right now, God. You'll speak to them. I just encourage you to say out loud right now, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. said to me I withheld anything from you that had not said of me I withheld anything from you that had not said of me I withheld anything from you that had not said of me I withheld anything from you
there's a person here who's just supposed to say that they forgive their dad. And that, just to let that go. I don't know who it's meant for, but God knows and you know. And just let his love heal your hearts and their memories. He saves all our tears and he knows our pain. Rachel was saying that some of you need to forgive your dads. I believe the same thing for those dads who are here who have messed up, that they need to just accept that forgiveness from God. And that they need to just know that even if their children don't forgive them, even if their children leave them, God, that you'll never leave them, that you love them, that you've forgiven them. Pray that Right now, if you feel like your father who has messed up, you will just ask God for forgiveness right now. He is faithful to forgive you of your sins. Right now, he will do that. And I encourage any children right now, if you're with your father right now, and he's here, and just to tell him you love him. Just let him know I'm so proud of you, Dad. I'm saying that to my dad right now. I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. Even if your father isn't a good example of Christ or a good reflection, that's where grace is that we we fail so many times. I couldn't I can imagine if I was in the responsibility to be a father, to be the head of a household. That's a lot of pressure. But just know that we know that's a difficult task, but. God is the one who can help you. He's the one who can forgive you. He's the one who can teach you. He's the one who can guide you. I also pray for those people who have always wanted to be fathers, but have never had the chance to have children, or they're trying to have children right now, but it's just not happening. To know that there's so many kids that are hurting there's so many kids out there that don't have fathers that you can just be a blessing to, that you can encourage. But just because you don't have your own children, that, that doesn't mean that you're not loved and you're not appreciated as a man. Lord, I pray for those people right now too. I just feel that there's some people here that are maybe frustrated. It's a couple or something that trying to have kids or something, I pray, God, that you will please just strengthen them, encourage them, God, and trust that as we're following you and seeking you, that your timing is the best, that you know what we need, God. You'll provide all of our needs, God, and all of our wants. You're so faithful, God, every time you show up. You showed up for Abraham. Even though he was old, God, you knew the perfect timing. Lord, let us be like Abraham, been saying a lot like Galatians 3 6 says God that just like his faith God it was counted as righteousness so I encourage everyone here before we finish up that if you feel like you failed that you have failed and you're not righteous right now that cool thing is that if you just have faith and trust and believe that God is good and he was faithful to forgive you of your sins that he loves you that you have a purpose you have a calling just like it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, to rejoice always, to pray continually, to just be thankful, 
and that's God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So Lord, help us rejoice in you, that you are good, you are faithful. This could be a day where we could be sad for some people, and it could be hard, God, for others, but this is a day that you have made that we will rejoice in God in it, because you are our Abba, God, you are our Father. We cry out to you, God, we need you, we love you. Our hearts are truly desperate for you. For some people, maybe you're just, your heart is stony and you're just cold, and Lord, I pray that you will just soften and warm those hearts up, God. Let them understand, let us all understand, especially me, God, that I'm the one, I just need to humble myself before you, God, and you will lift me up, you will encourage me, God, and you will do mighty works, God, through us if we just humble ourselves before you. My heart is desperate, my heart is desperate, my heart is desperate for you. talk about fathers. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to turn to Deuteronomy. We're going to turn on to all kinds of different uh, places. So uh, just have your Bible ready, I guess. But the title of today's message is Dads, We Need You. And how many know that's true? Yes. I, I, I did a sermon a couple years ago, but it was saying how that if a mom serves God and the dad doesn't, the children have a 20% chance of walking with the Lord. That's right. 20%. But if the, if the, I mean, sorry, did I say the mom, the mom loves God and the dad doesn't? Right. But if dad loves God, then the children have an 80% chance of walking with the Lord. How many know that's good? And that shows that dads really set the precedent for walking with God. Now, here, here's the sad part, though. A lot of times, sadly, in America, the spiritual leader of the home is who? The mom. The mom. And we wonder why America is sort of, the Christianity is sort of declining. That means we need to what? Pray, like Mariah said, and, and, and Rachel said, we need to encourage men to be the spiritual leaders of their home. Amen? Because if they are, then it's going to encourage the family to follow God. It's going to encourage especially the children to follow God. Well, let's pray and ask God to bless this time. Father, we just thank you, Father, for every father here. And I ask that right now, Lord, you would bless them. I pray, Father, you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. And as it was said and prophesied that, Lord, any discouragement, any failures, Lord, that you would right now cover them with your precious holy blood. And I pray, Father, there's any children here like myself who didn't have a father or had a bad father. I pray, Lord, you would heal them, Lord, that you would help them to release their fathers. And that if their father, especially if their father's passed away, that now they would forgive their father, their earthly father, and then turn to you, their heavenly father. Amen. I pray that no one here would be deceived by the evil one to picture you, Father God, as their earthly father, if their earthly father was bad. 
But let them see you as you are. Let them see you as a loving Father that so loved them that you gave your Son to die on a cross for them. Amen. That they could have new life in you. So I pray, Father, that whatever need is here today, whether it be children that are hurt for not having a father, or whether it be fathers who have realized they've failed as a father, I pray today that you would use this message. Use your word and your Holy Spirit to encourage the fathers to be the father that you want them to be. And I pray that, Father, that you would bless and encourage children that, Lord, you are the father to the fathers. If their father is gone, that you would be the father to the fathers, as your word says. So, Lord, we commit this time to you. We pray that you would speak to us in a powerful way. And everyone agreed, said, Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name, Amen. When we talk about dads, we can experience all kinds of feelings. Some of us, when we think of our dads, brings up some really sad feelings. And for some of us, it brings up some really bad memories. Uh, I, some of you know, my dad, I never knew my dad. My dad was a mafia guy. And my, my mom didn't want me to be with my dad and because he was so bad. But, uh, so I was told kind of a lie. It's a long story. But I didn't know my dad. I didn't meet my dad until I was 32 years old. And even when I met my dad, he didn't really want to know me. He just kind of was like, yeah, whatever. And then he started, he died. He was dying a year later. And then he kind of said, okay, I'll meet you now that, you know, I have nothing. You know, I'm dying. And so it's kind of sad. It was sad. But I want to say this. Can I say this? this is free here. But I remember being at his funeral. And I remember just crying and crying. And all my Italian family said, oh, look, he loved his father. How many know I didn't really love my father that much? Because I didn't know my father. But here's what it was. It was I was crying because I didn't have the Disney ending. Yes. Because my dad didn't say to me, I love you, son. He said it one time and he took it back a week later. But he, I said, I wanted him to say, I love you, son. I'm proud of you. And then we have this great relationship. Yes. So I was sitting there at the funeral just crying and crying and crying, realizing that it's never going to happen now. But you know what's so funny as I was doing that, the Lord was like, hey, look up here. Look at He was like, the Lord was like, hey, great. And he was saying, I am your father. Now, isn't it weird how when I heard that, I go, yeah, God, but, you know, it's a little harder to seek you than it is to seek an earthly father. But I want to tell you that God truly is a father to the fathers, and he's the best dad you could ever have. Amen. Amen. And so know that and know that. Amen. So don't let that, don't get stuck if you've been hurt by an earthly father. But hopefully for most of you, when you think about dads, you have good memories. You have pleasant memories. Amen. Hopefully you have that. Men, how many have good dads? Raise your hand. There we go. Hopefully, but some of you, as I said, you haven't. But now turn to God for that healing. For those of us who have the privilege of being called dads or fathers, we also have been called to be, hear this, the spiritual leader of our homes. It's a role that has been given to us by God himself. As a husband and a father, we've been called by God to be the head of our household. Paul said this in Ephesians 5.23, he says, husband, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. We're to be the head of our family. And hear this, God will allow the wife to be the head when she has to be, but that's not God's perfect will, amen? amen. And we see that by the statistics of when a woman loves God and the husband doesn't, how the kids don't follow God. It's like that old, remember the Cats in the Cradle song, Cat Stephen? I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know, I'm going to, you know, if you want, if you dads want your kids to love God and follow God, then guess what? You love God. You follow God. Amen? Amen. Unfortunately, many men show great leadership at work and on the sports field and in business, but we often fail to exhibit this quality at home. I want to say this. I have met a lot of people in ministry. I've known two colonels. Colonels are right. It's right underneath being a general, isn't it? A yeah. colonel. Yeah. Two colonels. I've met uh, the lieutenant colonel in, in uh, the sheriff's department. And these three men that I just think of, and there's more than that, but just those powerful men that lead hundreds of people, yes. all three of those men did not lead their family well. Isn't that crazy? I don't understand. Like, how can you lead hundreds, if not thousands of people, but you can't lead your family. Well. And hear this, guys. I want to say this. Priorities. The number one priority for us as a Christian man is what? Love God. What's the second priority? 
Love our wives. What's the third party? Love our, our, our children. Children are third. Amen? They're not, they're not first or second. They're, they're, they're third to your wife or husband. And then what? Fourth is your job. And isn't that wild how men a lot of times put job, sometimes even above God or even above their wife or their kids. But we need to say God, spouse, child, or God, <laughs> spouse, children, job. It's, it's sad to me to see people. And I asked this one colonel, I said, why is it that you stink so bad as a father? No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But I said, why is it? And, and it's so weird. I asked him talking about someone else and didn't realize I was talking to him. I just met him. And he's like, and he goes, I said, why is it so many guys that are great leaders of men, but they're not great leaders of their home? And he goes, Ooh. And, I, and I could see him all of a sudden. He got kind of flustered. And I go, Ooh. I touched the nerve. And he goes, well, you know, uh, we, we lead people all day long and we want to come home and just relax. I mean, you know, Dad, hear me. I, I work a lot and I talk about God a lot. And a lot of times I, forgive me for saying this, but this is the truth. And sometimes they go, I've done my God thing for the day. And I come home and I don't want to talk about God anymore to even my family. But God, God says, that's when you really need to talk about God. Amen. 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 And you got to, I mean, <laughs> I just says, sometimes we've got to suck it up a little bit. And God's got to be more than a job. God says, you know, this isn't a job for you, right? This is your life. Amen. And you just happen to get paid for it, but it's not your job. It's your life. Amen? Amen. And so we need to realize that, dads. We need to realize when you come home, don't grab that remote. I tell you, it's so funny. My kids, we, we quit cable when they were young, and it was like giving up my U.S. citizenship, you know, <laughs> quitting that. I mean, and the cable company, are you sure you want to do this? You know, like, yes, I, I'm really sure because I don't want to, so I know it's God, right? Because my flesh is like twitching. I felt like I was coming off a drug overdose, you know. Uh, uh. But, but hear this, my kids, you know, so I, I kind of was raised with TV, so I have that addiction to TV a little bit. My kids don't really have it. So when we go on vacation, I'll sometimes watch a little TV, or a lot of TV, they'll say, to see what we're not missing. Because I want to know. And my kids will go, Dad, please don't turn it on TV. It's like they're seeing me do crack or something. Please don't do it, Dad. Don't turn it on. Because once I turn it on, I'm like there. And they're like, hey, Dad, let's, we're by the ocean. Let's go to the ocean. No, i got to watch TV. You know, I mean, <laughs> hear me, guys. TV is stupid, okay? How many, how many of you have ever, as a Christian, watched TV and go, that was awesome. I feel so encouraged in my spirit. Most of the time you go, that was a waste of two hours. Yes. Right? Yeah. And nowadays, like I said, if people have Netflix... It's like you go, what's the least worst movie I can watch? Yes. Amen? Yes. I mean, there's not, there are very few. I mean, and, and there's such an agenda in the movies. Amen? Amen? I mean, just crazy, all the agendas. And so anyways, that was all free. But I'm saying is, you know, instead of grab the remote and look dumb, you ever seen your husband when they do the remote? Just, you know, you don't look smart. Your wife's not going to be impressed with that's the face I married right there. Put the remote down. Love your kids. Love your wives. Love God and seek Him in TVs of the devil. Amen? <laughs> Where was I? I don't know. <laughs> the Chinese have a saying. I like this saying. It says, that rings very true to me. It says, it's harder to lead a family than it is to rule a nation. Isn't that good? It's harder to rule, uh, to lead, it's harder to lead a family than it is to rule a nation. I remember talking to my Italian uncle and I said, why is it that it's, it seems like it's hard for you to really talk? I can talk to all these other kids, but sometimes my own sons, it's hard to talk to. And he goes, that's your dad, because they, they know you. You know, you're not like this perfect hero man. They know your strengths. They know your failures. And sometimes it's hard. And it's funny, I was a youth pastor for 20 years, and I could talk to everyone else's kids. And I remember going, having kids isn't that hard. It's not that big a deal. But then I had my own kids. <laughs> And then I realized, like I said, they saw that my strengths, but they also saw my weaknesses. And sometimes it's hard for me to really be as close to them as sometimes even someone else's kid. But guess what? We need to be, we need to pray to be that leader in our family rather than just being a leader of our company or our nation or whatever we think. Because guess what? Every dad, when they are dying, the stats say, none of them say, I wish I'd worked more. That's right. None of them say, I wish I'd spent yes. more time at the business. Most dads said, I wish I would have spent more time with my children and my wife. Amen. And that you can never make up. Right. Oh, you, you can try, but guess what, guys? Young fathers, do it now. Amen. Yes. Amen. Absolutely. 
That doesn't mean don't be good at your work, but that means put, you know, priorities. Say, God, help me when I work at work to be the best worker, but when I'm home to be the best person at home. Don't just come home to crash. Realize now you might be done with your job at your work, but now you have a job at home. Amen? Amen. One reason husbands uh, and fathers fail to take up the reins of spiritual leadership in their homes, I believe, is because they simply don't know how. They've never been trained or they have never had or seen a biblical leader model for them. They've never seen it model. I didn't see it model. They've never seen a model in their lives because maybe they didn't have a dad. As I said, like, I didn't have a dad. I, I didn't want to get married because I was so afraid of being like my father, not being there. I was so afraid that I would be the very dad that my dad had been to me, that I would be a failure. I, mean, I remember at times when things would get hard, I would hear the enemy speak to me and say, hey, no one is there for you. You don't have to be there for your kids. Yes. And I would just say, you know, I'd realize, and the Lord would say, Craig, are you serious? So you want your kids to struggle with anger towards you like you did with your father? He said, you be the dad you wished your father had been for you. Amen? Amen. Amen? Yes. Maybe they had a dad that, that wasn't a good example of how to be a godly father. Maybe they saw a dad who said a lot of things, right? How many, how many good old Catholics out there? I was raised with this as a Catholic. Do as I say, not as I do. How many hated that like me? It was the most hypocritical thing. And I'd say, what are you talking? You drink and you tell me not to drink. You, you know, I mean, you know, your kids do what they see modeled, not what you say. And this is the reason that so many fathers fail, not because they want to, but because they don't know how to be a father God's way. That's right. Well, today we're going to look at how God wants us to live and act as earthly fathers. Statistics say this, that 82%, and this should encourage you to be a good father, 82% of all hardened criminals come from a fatherless home. I was that criminal. Before Christ, I was a criminal. I was a drug dealer. I was a thug. I was somebody who would have either been killed or gone to jail. I was on my way to jail, and by the mercy of God, I got off in a technicality or I would have done nine years in prison. I mean, I probably wouldn't be here today if I had done nine years in federal prison as an 18 year old. Yes. But I deserved it. I was a thug because why? Here's why, I want to hear it simplified. It was the world had done me wrong yes. because I didn't have a father so now I could do the world wrong. Yes. Yes. I told you what my grandma said to me. She used to say, trying to be encouraging, she really was in her weird way. She said, Craig, you realize this in life, nobody cares for you. Now, if you believe that, and she tell me as a little kid, then why would you care about anyone else in this world? That's right. But how many know, I, I remember, that my, I think Mariah said this, but I used to say this when I get angry. I'd say, God, see, my grandma's right. Nobody cares. You ever felt that way? Anyone else there? No one? I'm the only one? Okay, I'm the same. But, but the Lord said, can I finish that statement for you? And God said, nobody cares like me. Amen. Isn't that good? Nobody cares. Like me. Isn't it funny? We always look for people to make us feel like we're cared for. But guess what? If you're hurting, turn to God. Amen. And I promise you'll never be disappointed. Amen. Oh, it might take a little work to get, get you know, where you sense his presence. But how many know he's there whether you feel him or not? Amen. And you need to turn to him. Amen? Amen. As I said, 82% of all hardened criminals come from fatherless homes. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that there was no father in the house at all, but it means that the dad was just, hear this, some dads are just too busy to really invest in the lives of their children. Well, as we look in the Word of God today, we're going to see how God would have us love our children and lead our children in His ways. And hear this, guys. How many of you are going to be accountable as a father for how you led your family? Isn't that funny? We just want to have kids just because, I don't know, our name carried on, machismo. But I mean, if God has entrusted my kids to me to nurture them and grow them in the ways of God. And God's going to hold me accountable to that. How do I know this? What did Jesus say? If you cause one of these little ones to stumble, Jesus said, it's better to what? Take a 1,500 pound millstone, 15 to 200, 2,000 pounds, and put it around your neck and throw yourself into the sea. I mean, when God tells you to commit suicide, you need to hear what he's saying. 
He's saying, don't stumble your sons and daughters. Don't stumble your children. Don't stumble little children because I care about the little children. Yes. Now, you know, that should make us a daggle. Gulp a little. Because God's going to even as fathers, you know, we think that means doing something else to someone else's kids. That means doing something even to our kids. And we need to be dads that can say to our children humbly, follow me as I humbly follow Christ. Amen. Amen. Point number one, we need to train our kids. Amen? Train our kids. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart. How many of you claim that verse for kids that have kind of fallen away? Claim that verse. Now, there's a difference between training and teaching. Teaching is giving instruction. It's instructing people, but training is making sure that what they're doing is right. What they're doing is the right thing. When I was a wrestler, I used to watch movies on how to do a sideways or throw. Any wrestlers out there? There's one. Any wrestlers? There's only one wrestler in here. No one else wrestler. There we go, wrestler. But uh, no one wants to admit to being a wrestler. Oh, no, that's weird. Um, but but uh, I was a wrestler because I got kicked out of basketball, so I had to be a wrestler. And uh, the guy it was really neat. The guy challenged me because I was kind of a wannabe tough guy. He goes. So Rotary's ready to do a real sport? I'm like, well, yeah, you know. And so I started wrestling. Well, a side wizard throw is a pretty complicated throw. It's where you basically, you push the guy, the guy comes into you, you take the guy straight back, and then you twist, and you put all your weight, you spin him, and uh, if you do it wrong, you're going to pin yourself. So it's not good, you got to know what you're doing. So uh, I watch movies on it, I watch uh, videos on it, teachings, but it was my coach, Dan Hicks, who trained me on how to do this side wizard throw right and effectively. Because as I said, if you didn't do it right, if you just watched the video, a lot of times when I first started, I started pulling people on top of me to pin me. That's not good as a wrestler, amen? And so we need to be not just taught, but we need to be trained. We need someone to come alongside us and show us how to do it the right way and effectively. There's a big difference between telling my kid or kids to have a quiet time, which is teaching, and then they're showing my kids how to have a quiet time. Amen? Right. It's demonstrating for them. Letting them walk in instead of me watching TV. Letting them walk in and seeing me reading my Bible. When I'm not, not just reading my Bible, not just for a sermon, but reading my Bible just because I love God. And one quick note here, I want to say this. Is notice that here it says in Proverbs 22, 6, it says, in the way he should go. There's a way that God has ordained for your son or daughter to go. And that might not mean being in the career you're in. It might not be, mean being an engineer like you. He or she might be called to do something else. Your son might be called to be a pastor or a plumber. But we as dads need to be sensitive to the calling that God has for them. Amen? Sometimes we want our kids to be like us, but sometimes, you know what I mean? Because sometimes I was kind of, uh, you know, I remember, I, I think I told you this uh, before, but I'll say it again. I like to repeat myself. But anyways, um, that was a joke. But anyways, um, you guys don't think it's funny, do you? All right. Um, but my kids, it's funny, I was kind of a raised a tough guy. And my kids, because I think because I would be so tough at times, they tend to be more hippie-ish. And I remember we watched the movie. I don't recommend it, but we watched the movie because I want to know about it. Uh, how many, um, what was it, uh, The Shack. And The Shack kind of has some weird theology, but I wanted to watch it. But it was so weird. I watched it, and I was kind of like, what? Jesus is a woman? God's a woman? You know, it just was kind of weird. But, but hear this. My kids, because it showed Jesus as kind of this cool carpenter who kind of like was really mellow, and everyone's real loving. And my kids, both Morgan and Cannon, said, I kind of like that movie. And I was like, yesterday. No, I was like, are you kidding me? And I, was, I remember I was just disgusted. I was like, what? And they were like, well, I didn't like the theology, but, but I just liked the love of it. Yes. You know what that did to me? Yes. Showed that I sometimes am so right that I'm wrong. Yes. And I always say this. There's a difference. Is that if you just have law without love, it's what? Legalism. But if you have love without law or the word, you have liberalism. Yes. So we need to balance, amen? Yes. We need the word with love balanced. And only the Holy Spirit can give it to us. Because the temptation is to go one extreme, to be liberal, like all, all roads lead to God. That's not true. Yes. Or to be really harsh and not show the love of God. Yes. To where my kids are kind of going, Dad, 
uh, you're true, you're right, but I don't sense a lot of love at times. And how many of that really, that kind of spanked me. That kind of made me go, whoa. And now, you know, and I told you, I kind of went through, God said to humble me this year. As I said, some of you know, I almost died. A couple of months ago. And when you di almost die, it'll really make your life, it'll really shore up the priorities of your life. Yes. It'll kind of soften you. I mean, not just soften the belly. I mean, it'll make you soft to where you're humble, to where you just go, you know what? I, I want to leave a legacy. Yes. I don't want my kids around the funeral, you know, around my casket going or whatever it is, the ashes saying, yeah, my dad, he was really right, but he was a cranky old guy for Jesus. <laughs> I don't want that. I want my sons and daughters to say, man, I really, my dad really demonstrated for me the love of Jesus. I saw Jesus in my dad. I miss my dad. Not thank the Lord, my dad's gone. You know, I don't want that. <laughs> Amen. And you see that. I'll tell you this is free. When I do funerals, you'll see the wife or sometimes the kids, but the wife a lot of times say, oh, my husband, oh, he's such a neat man of God. Now, he wasn't the easiest guy to get along with. Trust me. Let me tell you about that. And they go off for an hour about how he's so hard. Yeah. I, I don't want that. I want my family to go, man, I really miss him. Dad, you know, when my wife was doing all the hell stuff, my dad would sneak out and we'd go to Dairy Queen and get us blizzard. It was so cool. <laughs> Some of you don't think that's cool. That's not right, Craig. See, that's not uh, going to die. You know. <laughs> but we need to cry out in prayer that our kids will accomplish what God has called them to accomplish before the foundation of the earth. Amen. We got to say, Lord, I want your will for their lives, not my will. Second, we need to pray for our kids. Amen. We need to pray for our kids. Lamentations 2.19 says this, rise during the night, cry out, pour out your hearts like water to the Lord. Lift up your hands to him. There it is. Lift up your hands. So those of you who are old Baptists that have a hard time lifting your hands, there it is. You don't get a good reception. Yep, right there. You know, but you lift up your hands. What is it? Surrender. Lift up your hands saying, I can't do it. Lift up your hands in prayer, pleading for your child. When Candon walked away a couple months ago, again, control, because I can be kind of a, <clears throat> right? You never noticed that, but I can be. And, and, and the Lord said, stop it. You pray for Candon. You stop doing anything except pray. Now we know when you're kind of a control freak, just praying is hard. But the Lord said, you've messed it up enough. No, I didn't say that. But you know, just pray. And that was hard. I wrote it. And there's kids that used to be in control. I wrote a text to him saying, son, I'm releasing you to God. I'm not going to do anything more and tell you anything more. I'm just going to love you and pray for you. He thought I was basically writing him off. Say, I'm done with you, son. <laughs> Isn't that wild? That he's so used to me saying, this is what you got to do. This is what you got to do. But I finally said, I'm done. I'm just going to pray for you. And I mean, you know, God did more in a couple months yes. than I could have done in 20 years. Yes. Amen? Amen? So pray for your kids. Plead for your kids. Amen? Amen. 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 We as men need to pour out our hearts to God daily in prayer for our kids, that he would spare our children from the effects of this crazy world. How many know this world's crazy? Yes. Have you noticed this? It's Isaiah 5 when it says, it's not in my notes, but Isaiah 5, that it says that good will be called evil and evil will be called good. Yes. Sweet will be called bitter and bitter will be called sweet. Everything's backwards today. And, you know, it's just it's crazy what our kids have to be surrounded with day after day. I shared this message or a message like this in 2004, 15 years ago. Now, how many like me, the older you get, a year seems like about two or three months. Yes. You know what I'm talking about? Now, some yes. of you kids go, what? It's because it's all relative. You're only 19 years old. There's only one 19th of year. I'm 57. This is a 57. I've been around. I've been there, done that. I have a t-shirt. Amen? Yes. So this is it, right? But hear this. In 2004, I shared a message like this. And here this gay marriage had just been legalized in Massachusetts 15 years ago. You know what I said in the pulpit 15 years ago? I said, and it's definitely true today. I said, what we are, were seeing back then, that gay marriage is going to be considered normal to our, a lot of kids in the future. How many know that's true today? If your kids go to secular school, they're indoctrinated. We had kids in this church, when I talk about the Bible says about homosexual, how many know we love the homosexual, amen? We love the sinner, but we hate the sin. Amen. 
We do not believe that you can be a homosexual Christian. You can be a Christian who struggles with it, but you can't be a practicing homosexual and be a Christian, it says in 1 Corinthians 6. Amen? Amen. And so we need to say that in love. And how many know kids will say, why does Pastor Craig say that? Our school celebrates it. What's going on? What's wrong with him? Doesn't he got with the picture? And how many know our kids are living in a very trying time? Hear this, guys. I believe a lot, sadly, a lot of the society is influencing the church more than Christ in us, and the Word is influencing the society. Yes. Amen? Yes. You awake? You know, hello? Yes. And we see that because we're so, most churches are caving on it. Most churches now are not even speaking about it. But how many know that's why we're in the trouble we're in? Because too many pastors, Billy Graham, before he died, said, I wish I'd spoken out more about marriage and about homosexuality. But I didn't. I thought, just get people saved. It'll be fine. And he realized, remember, he signed the Marriage Amendment Act. And he said, I wish I would have spoken out when I had such a great platform. But hear this. You know why I think, can I just say this? I don't mean to trample on his grave. But hear this. I think he also knew the, the repercussions if he had said that. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know? This is why our church is such a mega church. Because of stuff like this. Amen? This is why I get letters on the radio from, you know, it's so funny, San Francisco Christian radio station wanted me to be on the radio there. I was concerned about people coming here and put, you know, I mean, the things I said, you know, which are biblical, but just the craziest. I wasn't sure. I mean, your, your tough pastor was a little wimpy on that. I didn't know if I was ready for, homeless, uh, for, for, for uh, uh, San Francisco. Because I think I would have some people. I've already had some people you know, say some crazy stuff to me. But isn't that wild? Just 15 years, guys. And now that's the new normal. Pastors are saying you can be a Christian homosexual, sadly. So we need to be passionately pray for the protection of our kids mentally. We need to pray for, the, for their future, especially if they go to a secular school. And for the future of America. And America that they're going to have to raise their kids in or your grandkids in. Can you imagine if we do not have a revival? What's going to be the new normal in 15 years from now? Amen? What's going to be? I always say this. Remember, some of you old timers like me, my age, remember when you could watch TV and be a Christian? My three sons. Doo -doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo. You could watch the Waltons. You could watch uh, 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 Little House on the Prairie. Now, what's the new normal show for kids? Oh, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. Oh, the Osbournes. I mean, what's the new normal? Oh, those are the good old days. You know, that's how crazy it's become. I'll move on. I can see some of you going. Okay. Thirdly, we need to nurture and love our kids. Nurture and love our kids. Ephesians 6, 4 says this. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Paul doesn't say anything to mothers here. Notice that? As it relates to raising children. Why? Because it's natural for a mother to care about her kids. And to do whatever she can for her kids. But for us dads, sometimes a little different story. I'll give you an example. Uh, Morgan just got married last weekend. Amen? And, and so, I, you know, we kind of helped out a lot. And I feel like I've been pretty good to my kids. So I, I, we were saying, okay, we were so busy, we didn't have the time to get him a gift. So I said, I'm just going to give him some cash. And I told my wife what I'm going to give her. And she goes, that's it? <laughs> I was like, I thought it was a pretty good gift. That's it? Seriously? Your firstborn son? That's it? And I remember just going. So I said to Morgan, I go, Morgan, here it is. Would you rather have me give you a smaller gift now and be able to take care of myself when I'm older or give you a big gift now and you take care of me when I'm older? And Morgan said, I'd rather have a smaller gift. Okay, so. But I mean, but that's my wife. I'm not putting her down just say that's why She's just like, that's it? Cheap out? You know I mean? I was like, wow. wow. You know, I mean, man, I thought I was a good dad, but you know, Morgan said it was great. He's like, yeah, cheap out. No, I'm kidding. He didn't say that. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I just would like to be able to, you know, not have to eat cat food when I'm, when I'm 70. But anyways. Colossians 3.21 says this. Or, sorry, where was I? It just went on too far. Okay. Now, what does it mean to provoke? Or aggravate your children to wrath or anger. Colossians 3.21 says this. Fathers, it kind of gives a little more clarity. Fathers, don't aggravate or provoke your children. If you do, they will become discouraged. and They will become discouraged. Or the other versions say they'll try, they'll quit trying. 
And I know you can sometimes quit trying if you've been pushed too hard. To provoke your kids, your kids to wrath means to make them discouraged. And how is that? By loading them down with unrealistic expectations or demands, which is something I tend to do or have tend to done, done past tense. But because I was raised in a perfectionistic home, so I kind of brought that in Christianity. And I'm having to try to forsake that, to let go of that such perfection. I never forget my grandfather kind of taught me perfectionism, wanting me to be a lawyer. And the reason he wanted me to be a lawyer is not because I was so smart, but because I was good at arguing. I was good as a drug dealer. I could fight and I could argue and I could get good deals. And he, he kind of liked my shrewdness, my, my harshness, I should say. And he wanted me to be a very successful lawyer because he also, he felt that he wasn't very successful. He was an artist. He was pretty successful, but later in life. So he kind of felt like a failure. So he kind of was living his dreams through me, it seemed like. And when I didn't have the heart or patience or smarts for being a lawyer, and I remember I got saved right then when I was about 18, and I remember when I told him I wanted to be a pastor, I was like, he, I mean, here's what he said to me. He said, Craig, being a man and being a Christian is what you do when you're 80, when you're 65, 70, when you die. Oh, no. That's for old people. It's not for you. That's for people that have nothing. And I remember just so hurt. And, and I remember him, and this will tell you so wild, fathers. My grandpa said, the only Christian I respect is Billy Graham. And I remember right then I said, okay, then I'm going to be the next Billy Graham. Not a very big shoes to fill, right? You know, you know, <laughs> don't have a yoke. And I remember saying I'm going to be it. And I, and I did that for a long time with, uh, with Say Us to Life on the radio. I, I spoke to crowds in Tucson here to like 8,000, 9,000 people. And I remember it was wild when God said to me once, he said, how was it? When I did this big outreach with DC Talk back in 94. And it was like 300, 400 kids got saved. And I remember I was so happy thinking I'm, I'm going to be the next youth Billy Graham. And the Lord said, how was it? I said, Lord, it was great. It was awesome. He goes, hmm. And I, whenever God, hmm, I was going, I knew, hmm, what's that? And he goes, he goes, I said, what do you mean, hmm? And he goes, you did this for yourself, not for me. You did this for your dead grandpa. And even though God used it, don't get me wrong, it was the motive wasn't really for God. The motive was for me to appease and get the love of a dead grandpa. Some of you might be struggling with that, trying to please a dead father. But guess what? You need to please your living heavenly father. Amen. Amen? Amen? Amen. Yeah, you give me a God. But I remember when my grandpa gave up on me, it was so devastating for me as a kid. And I tried to live, you know, I had that carrot always before me, trying to <laughs> please my grandpa. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Yes. The tendency for men is to say, earning a living is my job, but raising the kids is my wife's job. Not true. Scripture says otherwise. The word of God says dads are to bring up their children. How? How do they bring up their children? First of all, by being there. Amen? Being their dad. I, I tell you, all these dads, I, I can tell you one dad. I know one pastor who every, he would, he would leave, he would preach on Sunday. Sunday afternoon, he'd leave to go fishing with the guys and be gone all the way till Tuesday, uh, till Tuesday morning. And he said he had three kids. And I'm just going, my goodness, why did you have kids? You're going to be gone all the time. I mean, no, my, you know, I have no hobbies. My hobby is eating <laughs> and my kids and my family. That's it. Amen. That's it. And that's about all I have time for. I couldn't go more. I wanted to buy a Harley, but if I bought a Harley, all I would do is sit in the garage and get dusty and my kids would bang into it and put marks all over it. So what would I do? I rent a Harley once a year. You get my little wannabe born to be wild out of my system. It's a lot cheaper. 150 bucks is a lot cheaper than 30,000. Amen? So, yeah. So I suggest you do something like that. But anyway, where was I? <laughs> but hear this. During show and tell, elementary kids were telling what their dads did for a living. One kid said, my dad is the president of his company. Another kid said, my dad travels all over the world. Another kid said, well, my dad is really rich. Another kid said, well, my dad's so rich that we have really nice cars, many cars, and a pool, and even a jet. Well, my daddy, this one little boy said, is a professional basketball player. And the kids and the teachers were very impressed with the stories until a little girl in the back of the class cautiously, kind of sheepishly, stood up and said, my daddy's here. 
That's just, my daddy's here. And I hear this. Are you there, dad? Are you there for your kids? Although we hear lots of talk about quality time, you hear that quality time. In many cases, I think it's nothing more than an excuse for not spending time with your kids. I love what Dr. Dobson said. He said this, the way you spell love to a kid is T-I-M-E. You can't say to a kid, okay, I got 10 minutes, let's do quality time. Kids are like, oh, what's quality time? Right? I never did that. Okay. Quality time, hurry up, come on, let's go. I love you, you love me? All right, good, let's go. You know, and no, it takes time. It takes time hanging out with your kids where all of a sudden they go, Dad, uh, uh, what about girls, you know, or, you know, you know, stuff like that, or whatever weird, you know, kind of conversation. It takes time to hang out with them before they ask you stuff, before they say, hey, Dad, I'm kind of struggling with, with, uh, with people at school and trying to be cool, and it takes time. But I want to tell you this, you know, Sonine, I, I love the ministry. It's very, you know, it can be hard at times. It can be very busy. But what was cool, cool about the ministry, at least I guess this is kind of like my job, but I could invite my kids in to be a part of it. I always brought my kids with me. You know, when we were doing ministry when Ken was a baby, I put Ken in, I held, we used to hold him when we'd have the speakers blaring and we'd hold his ears, you know, put like hands over ears and rock it up. And people would say, that's so terrible, that little precious baby. Right? Now he's a drummer, so he loves that beat. Right? But I mean, you know, but we just hold him and, and we had the kids there and we had them there all the time. They were always with us. Oh, we were sometimes working. And sometimes Ken, I think, I'm picking on Ken, I don't know why, but Ken would say to me, we'd go out to eat, you know, as a pastor, kids wait for you as you're talking to people. And Ken would say, Dad, come on, let's go. So then I'd buy him little Game Boys, little things like this, give him bread to eat. No, Ken, just to eat. But, uh, you know, just give him stuff so you do. But I remember is that Ken, what, uh, what he said to me, he said, Dad, a lot of times when we're out to lunch with you, sometimes you're not really with us. You're not really with us. And so I remember God really stressed this to me. I was, when we first started the church, I was really busy. I worked like seven days a week, probably 10 hour days, maybe 12. And I remember my first office was a little apartment. And uh, me and my assistant had that. And, and I remember because we didn't have a church yet. And uh, I would sit there and I'm out my, looking at my office and looked at Push Ridge and I had a little cul de sac where my apartment was. Um, and all of a sudden, this kid is playing ball with his dad. And here I am on a Saturday doing my message all day on Saturday. And I'm at the apartment. I'm thinking about my kids. So I was saying, Lord, I feel terrible. I, I'm not around my kids as much as I want. And God gave me this idea of what's called a special day. And a special day is where I take my kids every Saturday. It used to be every Saturday. Now it's Mondays because they have youth group. But every Saturday, I would take my kids to a movie or to dinner, or whatever they liked. They usually say it was for what I liked. It was where I liked to eat and the movie I wanted to see. But anyway, it's not. But, uh, I would take them out, and I would hang out with them. And we could talk about whatever. And it's really neat, because they all wanted to do it. You know, you always hear about kids don't want to be with their dad. They're like, Dad, when's their special day? Now that you know, Morgan's married, now a special day is more expensive, because now i got to take Veli, and i got to take Soraya <laughs> with them. And so, it's like, so it's not just one person i got to take. Two. But anyways, but... Uh, you know, we haven't done, but you know, you still want to do a special day. Yeah, you still like special day. Yeah, but get away from those wives. No, I'm kidding. I'm just teasing. But it was really cool, and I encouraged you. So I'd meet with my kids alone for three or four hours every, at least once a month. And to really have that quality time, and they loved it. And so I encourage you, if you're a busy dad, to maybe look into that too. Fourthly, we need to love our kids, hear this, enough to discipline them. <laughs> hear that. Discipline them. That is not a bad word, okay? Um, Proverbs 9, 19, 18 says this. Discipline your children while there is hope. If you don't, you will ruin their lives. Can I read that again? Discipline, young parents, I'm in the Craig version, your children while there is hope. If you don't, you'll ruin their lives. Hear this. I love the book. I never read it, but I love the book that said, I'm not your friend I'm your parent. Yes. How many know? First of all, you've got to be the parent before you're their friend. Yes. And I tell you, when you let your kids, my grandmother let my mom get away with everything because she never got love as a, as a kid. Her parents, she had an evil stepmother like Cinderella. And so she was treated terribly. So she then gave my mom everything. She was the firstborn. And my mom ended up hating her for it. Hear this. You want your kids to love you? Discipline them. Discipline them in love. 
and then your kids will love you. But if you let them be nuts, they're going to hate you because they're going to realize that they're not going to do so well in jobs. They're going to go, hey, my mom used to do this. They're going to realize my dad let me do this. It's important for us to discipline our kids. Amen. One study said this. I love this. Juvenile delin- about the juvenile delinquency. It said it, it came to this conclusion. Hear this. It's kind of humorous, but it's true. Every baby starts life as a little savage. I mean, that's not very politically correct, is it? He is completely selfish, totally self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it. Amen? His bottle, his mother's attention, his brother's toys, his uncle's watch. Deny him these things and he sees with rage and aggressiveness that would be murderous if he was not so helpless. He's dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no developed skills. It's basically worthless. No, okay. This means that all children are not just certain children are born delinquent. Hear this. If permitted to continue on in their self-centered ways of infancy, every child would grow up to be a criminal, a thief, a rapist, and a killer without discipline. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 13, 24 says this, He who spares the rod, or you could say the paddle, hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Promptly. When we give our kids empty threats, it produces unresolved guilt and has no healing or restoration for them. On the other hand, when I, was, when I would spank my children, and I wouldn't do it out of anger, that was one thing by the grace of God, because my family used to give me, as my German grandpa used to call it, a thrashing. And it was just that. It was hit you with anything and everything to where there could be blood. How I many know oh, that's not what I did? Okay? I would take, I would bend them over my knee, and I would give them very controlled spanking, and I wasn't like freaking out, and I would be firm. Except Mariah, she was like a little jellyfish. She'd like wiggle all around. And, and you know, my wife would try to spank her. She'd be spanking her head. or you know, just cause she would, And I'd say to Mariah, you wiggle, you get more. So you better stay still. So she'd, like, she'd try to just little wiggles. And so, but, uh, but I would spank my children. And, and it, hear this. It, when we give our kids empty threats, it doesn't have healing or restoration. On the other hand, and I spank my children, it's dealt with, the problem's dealt with quickly. And emotionally, in a way that they understood completely, they cry, and then I hug them, and they hug me, and I tell them that I love them, and then the issue is put behind us completely. Hear this, guys. I'll never forget this. You know, I, I, I would spank my kids, and when, I, when I'd spank my kids, I would not, you know, like I said, beat them or give them a thrashing, but I'd spank them hard because I didn't like spanking my kids. So I wanted to count. My wife would kind of like, oh, you know, oh, yeah. and the kids would be like, <laughs> if you ask the kids, would you like mommy to spank you? <laughs> yeah, it's like a picnic. But dad, do you want daddy to spank you? No, please, God. Oh, I love it. Oh, I love it. You know, it was just because I would spank him. And I wouldn't usually spank him more than five times, but I'd spank him firm. Now some of you are going, this is just so wrong. <laughs> do you know psychologists that say they don't believe in spanking? Once they had kids, most of them said, there's times you've got to spank. Because <laughs> the time out, your kid's like, time out. <laughs> right? You can spank, whoa, you know, a little fire to the bottom. Whoa, hey, how you doing? You know? And I'll never forget when, I think it was Candy, and I'm just kidding, everything's about you today, Candy. But uh, I'll never forget, I spanked Candon. And Candon was kind of a stubborn little kid. And, and so sometimes you sit there, and then sometimes he'd get ready for my spanking. <laughs> You know, and so I'm like, okay, <laughs> gonna be a little more, a little more heat on this thing because I want to, I want to see a brokenness. You know, I want to see a little bit like, oh, okay, daddy, I'm sorry, I don't want to see, that wasn't so bad. You know, dad, you're getting old. You know, no. So I remember spanking him, and he's like, <laughs> he's trying not to cry. And I said, Candon, do you know why I spanked you? Because I always want to make sure we re- restore it. I don't want to just spank him and walk away like my, you know, you want another one? I mean, it was like I wanted to understand that it's to reconcile. And so I said, Ken, do you know why? And he's like three or four, maybe four, I think, because I probably wouldn't have spanked him three. But four. I said, Ken, do you know why I spanked you today? He goes, yeah, because you're a jerk. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. No, he didn't say that. He said, Dad, the reason you spanked me is because you love me. And you want the best for me. And you know, you want me to know the difference between right and wrong. That's a pretty good answer for a four-year-old. And 
And I'm like, can I get this recorded, please? But I mean, that's, he knew. And that's where Spain, how do we know? It, they say, Dobson, I don't know if it's true today, but Dobson used to say, if there's two parents and they divorce, the child will usually want to go to the most disciplined parent. Now we think today they'd want to go to the loosey-goosey parent, but if you did it in love, they say most kids wanted to go with the parent that is disciplined. And so we need to know that. I like what Dr. James Dobson also said. He said, if we don't discipline our kids in love, then a police officer will have to do it and they won't do it quite as gently as we do. Amen? Amen. Your kid will think, I can do whatever I want. All of a sudden, what happens? Or crack like me, a nightstick to the head. How many know I wish my family had disciplined me in love and taught me right from wrong because, as I said, I was looking at nine years of prison. I got beat up by six police officers because I struck a police officer. I mean, they don't like that. And they struck me right back. And I learned, I fought the law and the law won. I fought the law and the law won. It's an old song for young kids. Right? <laughs> Fifthly, we need to teach our kids by our example. By our example. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 7 says this, And you must commit, your whole, uh, you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands or commandments. I'm giving you today, verse 7, repeat them, hear this, again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home, when you are on the road, when you are going to bed. Notice it's not just at bedtime. He says, when you're what? When you're, excuse me, at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. Basically, talk to them about the Lord all the time. Now, what is the commandments or commandment or commands that he's talking about here. He's talking about the great command or the golden commandment most of all here. Um, this, is, this is called the Shema. How many know this? The Shema. Has anyone heard about the Shema? This is Deuteronomy 6.4 and this is found in the mezuzah. You go to Israel, you'll see right on the doorpost of most homes, of Israelis' homes, Orthodox Jews, you'll see a little, little tube thing on the door and what happens is that's got inside it, it's got this next verse I'm going to read. And what they do is they'll touch it as they go in the house, they'll touch it as they go out, and they'll say this verse. Here it is. It's called the Shema, and in, in the Israelis call it this. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. How many know? Remember Jesus said, what's the number one commandment? He quoted this. Yeah. Love God. With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Other versions say, love God with everything you got. How many know a lot of us break that commandment? Yes. A lot of us don't love God all the time with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now the great commandment, the golden commandment, is not just as it said the Ten Commandments, but it's verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Because if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, then you'll hear this, dads, and moms, but dads most of all today, you'll want to obey His commandments. Amen? Amen? If you love God, you'll want to obey His commandments. All His statutes, the Lord God has told us to obey in His holy word. One of the greatest gifts that we dads can give our children is to show them how to love God. And notice that they are commanded to love God. You says, love the Lord thy God. Not if you feel like it. It says, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Commanded to love God, thus showing us that here this true biblical love is not a feeling. It isn't like you come to worship and go, I'm just not feeling it today. The thongs just aren't really touching me. Uh uh. It's not about what you feel, it's about is God worthy of your love. Amen. Amen? Amen. It ain't about the, I ain't feeling it. It ain't about that. That's what the world says, right? Well, that's why I have so much divorce, even in the church. Because what? I don't feel it anymore. How many are glad that Jesus doesn't do that with us? I just ain't feeling it today. You know, you haven't loved me, you haven't prayed to me for three weeks, I ain't feeling it. Adios. How many love God that He's faithful all the time? Amen. It says even when we're faithless, He's faithful because He cannot deny Himself. He remains faithful because that's who He is. Yes. And now I know we need to be Christ-like. That means our love should be faithful even when we're not feeling it. I love this. Isaiah 61.3 says this, 
It says, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Sometimes we need to do that. I love what David says. I don't know where it is in Psalms, but David says this. He says, I'm sorry, it's not in my notes, but he said this. He says, oh, my soul. He said, oh, my soul. He said, I'm sorry, oh, my soul. Why are you so downcast within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. He's saying, I don't care what you think, soul. God's good. And you start praising God. And hear this, guys. I've told you this a hundred times. I'm going to say this. I've done this. Because I've really, you know, I, I, I'm like you, I'm kind of feeling based. But I realize that sometimes as a pastor, I can't go by my feelings because it's really hard to preach in the pulpit if you're really discouraged. But sometimes I got to put on a, I got to say, God, I'm going to rejoice even though I don't feel it. And you know, it's so funny. I try to do this. And I'll just say, God, it's so good. God, it's so good. And I'll smile big. And then I'm walking down my stairs from my office, you know, on Saturday night, sitting there. I don't feel good, but I'm just, and I just, and I start laughing about me smiling when I don't feel good. <laughs> And then I start getting joy because I'm just doing it. And I love what Pastor Chuck said. He says what? First comes the motion, then comes the emotion. Amen? Amen? We say, no, give me the emotion, then I'll, get the, then I'll do the motion. No. He says, you do the motion, love God, praise, worship Him, and then He will what? Then He'll give you the emotion. Amen? And use the example. I don't have time for that. If you want to know an example, ask me outside later. But anyways, because um, we got to go. Um, where am I? Um, as I said, one of the greatest gifts is to that. So let your kids see you, dads. Worship God with all your heart. Let your kids hear you say how much you love him. Hear this, guys. Dads, don't sit there and go like this. Don't worship like this. It's a personal thing. Inside, I'm rejoicing. Because <laughs> your kids are going to go, what you do in moderation, they're going to do in excess. If you're just going this, they're going to be like, they're going to be playing Game Boy, they're going to be eating bread, they're going to be just going, blah, 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 doing whatever. But if you are engaged, worshiping God, then guess what they're going to go? They're going to look, oh, dad's in, oh, yeah, hey, it's cool. You know, they're going to be getting into it. And you need to realize you set the tone, right? If mom's out there going, ooh, how they're going, mom's weird, okay. But if dad's going, no, we love the Lord. Hey, praise God. And so she sees some tears streaming down, sincere tears, sees you get on your knees, then guess what? Sons are going to be like, hey, that's, yeah, that's cool. Dad's into it. Yeah. But if they see mom worshiping, they see dad going, this personal thing, personal, personal. They're going to go, no, I'm not into it either. I'm going to be just like you, dad. I'm going to be not into God also. How many dads like me could say, hey, I could get into it a little more? Yeah. I could be a better example of loving Jesus with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Most of us, most of all, we got to let our kids see how much we love God. But hear this too, by our obedience to Him. Amen. It's like Jesus said, what did Jesus say in John 14, 15? He said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. I love what... Henry Blackaby said, people say, I have such a hard time loving, or such a hard time obeying God. I love what Blackaby said, Henry Blackaby said, it's not really an obedience issue, is it really is a love issue. Because if you love God, you're going to want to please God. It's not going to be a heavy yoke of legalism, it's going to be I want to obey because I love God. Amen? Amen, Amen. Amen. that's it. There's an old Chinese proverb that says this, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. And the second best time is today. So maybe you've not been the dad you should have been. Maybe you haven't loved God the way you should, but guess what? Today is the day of salvation. Amen. Today's the day to start fresh. Today's the day to say, yes, God, by your grace and strength, I'm going to do this. Not in your own strength, but say, God, help me to be an example to my kids. I mean, if God wants to answer that prayer. And if you say this, I love it. One man of God said, you want a prayer that God will always answer? Lord, if there's anything in me you'd like to change, here I am, do it. Say, God, if I'm not a good father example of you, then show me the areas I'm willing to do. You do a work in me and I will surrender to you. Amen. Hear this, guys. Christianity isn't so much about do as it is about surrender and letting the Holy Spirit work in and through you. Yes. Amen. Amen. Now, I always thought, it's do. i got to pick myself up with bootstraps. Amen? Catholic, i got to do this for God. But no, it's a relationship. It's being filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's Him empowering you to be something you can never be on your own. Amen. Amen. Totally different. Yes. Also, one man of God said this, that every time when his kids were little, he would take one of them on errands in hopes that he could share something of the Lord with them. We dads need to be 
as I always say, we need to be here this supernaturally natural. Kids can smell a phony, amen? They can tell when you're putting it on. If you're trying to act spiritual, they also know if you're just putting on a show or just praying with them because your wife made you. Amen? They know. And that, well, uh, don't you love when people, you can tell them don't pray, Oh, sovereign, awesome, uh, the thou father of the sovereign Lord of the mighty, holy supplicator. I mean, they just start saying things like, you don't pray much, do you? You know, they'll say, Father, 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 Father. God's not sure. What's my name again? Oh, yes, Father. Thank you. I mean, now I'm not putting you down. If that's where you are, then start. But you could tell. Kids could tell. Like, you don't pray much, do you, Dad? You know, so you might want to practice on your own, okay? Anyway. But they also know when you really love God. And when your faith in Christ is real and vibrant. They can tell when you're praying with them because God is your all in all. Amen. God is your first love. I tell you that if your son or daughter sees Christ loving you, in you, or living through them, through you, then Christ is your first love. Then they'll want Christ to be their first love also. And I pray every dad here wants their kids to be as godly or more godly than they are. I want my kids to be much more godly than me. Amen? Amen. I was just praying on the way here. I said, Lord, you know all the dysfunction I have and, and my wife has and from our family background. I said, let most of it die with me. And let my kids glean the good of what you've done in me, not the old, bad, fleshly things of my heritage of bad. I mean, a lot of us have a lot of bad heritage. I mean, I know, I remember my Italians, you know, they, my family, they all cheated. All the men cheated. And they said, well, that's our heritage. That's how we are. I said, well, it's wrong and it stinks. And I don't want to do that by the Amen. grace and strength of God. Amen? Amen. And so we need to realize just because our grandpa and our grandfather and great grandfather did it doesn't mean it was right. Amen. Sometimes we need to break some history yes. and say, I want to be a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things are new. Amen? Amen. So if you want our kids, your kids, to love God and obey His commands, then we need to love God and we need to obey His commands ourselves. No more of the, the day of do as I say, not as I do. That's got to be gone. And we got to instead, you know this, this is one thing I've learned. All the people, it seems like 16 and above, that we were kind of taught to, to say we're sorry is so wrong and weak. But I've learned one of the strongest things you can say as a dad is to say I was wrong, sorry. Please forgive me. Oh, it's not easy. But guess what? Your kids will respect you a whole lot more when you yes. humble yourself. When you try to say, hey, shush, just do what I say, not as I do. When I heard that from very strong men, I went, mm, yeah. forget you yes. and forget your Christianity. I don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. Statistics say this, 89% of our learning comes from what we see modeled for us. Hear that, 89%. 9% of what we see modeled for us is how we learn. Only 11% comes from what we hear. No wonder when we're kind of religious hypocrites that our kids don't follow God. Because if you're not living what you say, but you're just saying the right things, they're going to say, forget it. So dads and moms, it's like the old saying goes, we are not what we say, but we are what we do. Our kids will do what they see us do. The days of just dropping off our kids at church needs to be over. I remember as a little kid, my friend's dad would drop me and his son off at church. And the only reason I went to church was for the candy bars. If you memorize the scripture, you get a candy bar. And I love the candy bars. You've got, you memorize two scriptures, you get two candy bars. I memorized all of them to get candy bars. It's like canon. People say, Ken, why do you love church? I love the cookies. Yeah. Right? And... And that's it. We, it needs to be. And I remember he would just drop us off and I'd go, why is your dad? I'm only like 10 years old. Why is your dad drop us off? How come he doesn't need church? You know? And he'd go, I don't know. And I'd go, that's wrong. I was a troublemaker. Anyways. Now maybe some of us have not read the Bible to our kids or prayed with them lately. Or maybe we've never consistently prayed or read with them ever. Well, hear this. Like we said, plant the tree today. There's no time like the present. There's no time like the present. And we need to also know the Word of God as dads so that we will be able to explain and teach the Word of God to our kids. Deuteronomy 6.20 says this, the same chapter. It says this, In the future your children will ask you, what is the meaning of these stipulations, laws, and regulations that the Lord our God has given us? 
We can't go just, uh -huh, I don't know. Ask your mother. That ain't right. If we can't explain the word of God to them, if we don't, we can't explain the word of God to them if we don't know the word of God ourselves. So we need to have a daily time with the Lord, a quiet time, a time to read God's word. And how many know, hear this, guys. Some of you are saying, well, I'm so busy. I told you what the Lord said to me. I said, God, I just don't have time to pray. I don't have time to read on my own. I'm studying for studies. I don't have time to just read your word, just to read you. And the Lord goes, I can get two or three hours every night. How many of you, a lot of you watch a lot of TV? So I mean, you need to put that remote down and pick up your Bible and say, God, speak to me. And I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying you do have time. Everyone has the same amount of time, 24 hours a day. And you make time for, hear this, what's important to you. If you love God, you're going to seek Him. If you don't, it shows right by your actions where you really are with God. If you haven't picked up your Bible for a month, two months, three months, a year, then maybe you need to say, hey, maybe today you need to say, I need to recommit my life to God and say, God, I'm sorry I haven't loved you the way you've loved me. Amen. I want to say this real quick as I end. That uh, there's an app. It's called the YouVersion app. Can you put me? I can't. I didn't. Did I tell you to put that up? But it's uh, the YouVersion app. It's free. And you can go to plans on it. It'll say plans. And there's the one-year Bible. And if you put that on, every day it'll give you the Old Testament reading the New Testament reading, and Psalms and Proverbs, and you'll read the whole Bible in one year. How many like that? And it's usually, for most people, I'm a little slow reader, but for most people, it's about 15 minutes a day. How many of you can give the Lord 15 minutes and then pray? But the one-year Bible, the you version, you're not sure about it, ask Kevin. He's the app man. But uh, you put it on your phone, and then it'll just, and it pops up to remind you, hey, read your Bible, read your Bible. You know, and it's really cool. You feel guilty, get 20 days behind, like, oh, you know. But... Uh, <laughs> Anyways, can someone get the lights? I would like dads right now and grandpas or dads that are to be, if you're going to be a dad to be, Kevin. Um, but anyway, no. But uh, we're open. But I want us dads to make a commitment to the Lord and to our kids today that we're going to really follow God. Amen? I want us to do that. Can the dads stand up? Could you dads please stand up? Everyone? Please stand up every dad. You dad? But every dad, stand up please. And stay standing if you would. But here's the commitment I want you to make. I want you to make this first commitment. That we'll be an example of how to love God for our kids. So they can see this love walked out in our everyday lives. Amen? Love God. Second that we would be committed to pray and read the Bible with them every day or as much as we can. Thirdly, I would like us to pray to be an example of obeying God's word to our kids every day. Can we make this commitment, men? Amen. Can we do that? Can we say amen to the Lord? Amen. By his strength and grace, we'll do this. And now I want to ask this. Can you play, Rachel? I want to ask this. That those of you who see these dads, go to them and lay your hands on them and pray for two, one or two, two or three minutes and really bless them and ask God to bless them. Because how many know this, guys, especially you, you ladies, your husband or your father determines the spiritual climate of this church. A lot of us focus on the women, but we need to also focus on the men to encourage them to be the men that God has called them to be. Amen. So will you go right now and just pray? Amen. Amen. Let me close in prayer. For them. Father God, we just thank you, Father, so much. I just want to say this. Can we just say this? Happy Father's Day, God. Amen. Thank you. You're the best dad that's ever been in the whole world, the whole universe. We just thank you, Father, that you don't ask us to do anything you haven't done. You always said you just freely you've been given, now freely give. So I pray that fathers, that they would look at you, Jesus. You said, you see me, you've seen the Father. That we look at Jesus. We look at you and say, God, help me to be like you. Empower us, Lord. Let us not be men to try to do this in our own strength, to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, our own human vigor. But let us humble ourselves and say, God, as a dad, I've fallen short at times. Or as a dad, maybe I've been a good dad, but I could even be a better dad. I could be a better representation of you. 
But I pray right now that you would fill every man with your Holy Spirit. That, Father, that they would see like Peter, that when Peter, in his own strength, before he was filled with the Spirit, he kept failing and kept putting his foot in his mouth, denied you because some little girl said, you're one of his followers. And he denied you three times. But when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, when he surrendered himself to the Holy Spirit and your power, then he was a mighty man of God to where he stood before the very people who crucified you and said, "This, you are the people who crucified the Christ. And then he was filled with boldness. He was filled with strength. He was empowered to do your will. So Father, right now, we just pray that you would fill every man here, even those that aren't fathers or maybe have never been a father. Fill them with your Holy Spirit and empower them to live for you. Empower them to truly and sincerely love you, Lord. Because I'll just say as a father, I can't do this, Lord. Even as a pastor, I can't do it without you. And I thank you what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, that when I am weak, when I admit I'm weak in myself, then I'm strong in the Lord. For as you said, God, you said, my strength is perfected in weakness. For when you are weak, then you are strong. Because my God, my grace is perfected in weakness. So Lord, I pray for every father here. Give them grace. Amen. Give them unmerited, undeserved, unin favor. God's riches at Christ's expense, one man of God said. Fill them with your spirit and empower them to be able to say like Paul, follow me, sons. Follow me, daughters. Follow me, wife. As I humbly follow God. Let us be men of God. Let us take our rightful place at the head of the household. Humbly through the power and strength of you, Father God. Let us humble ourselves before you. I love what D.L. Moody said. The branches that bow the lowest bear the most fruit. Let us bow humbly as fathers. Let us cry in the middle, the beginning of the day, Lord, help me. Help me to be the father you want to be. Not, not, help me not to be like my father was. If my father was a bad father, help me to be different. Help me to learn from my heavenly father and how to be a good father. Amen? Amen. So Lord, bless these dads and we thank you for them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give a clap. Let's stand. Bless the Lord one more time. Love you guys. Bless you. Happy Father's Day.
Thy 